I am presenting Union Gospel Presses Sunday School Lesson Number 11, Sunday, May 16, 2021. The lesson is entitled Saved by Faith. Lesson text comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Related scriptures are Romans 3, 21 through 26, Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 16, Matthew 10, 32 through 38. The place is from Corinth. The time is 56 AD. In the preceding section, Romans 9, 30 through 32, 33, Paul explained that since the advent of Christ, believing Gentiles had attained right standing with God. However, most of Israel had not. The reason was that the Gentiles in view had received righteousness through faith while most Jews sought righteousness through the law. Paul creates the imagery of an Olympic race. The Gentiles obtained the prize without chasing after it, while the Jews chased after it and stumbled because of the law. Originally, the law set the people of Israel apart from other nations, but it became an obstacle for them. The law was never intended as a way of salvation. The righteousness of God by faith is found only by faith in Jesus Christ. Today's aim. Facts. To study the biblical teaching of salvation by faith. Principle. To understand that we are saved by faith and not by any human effort. Application. To share with others the good news of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Illustrating the lesson. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and not by good works. Practical points. 1. We should desire salvation for those we love. Romans 10, 1 through 2. 2. Salvation requires specific doctrinal knowledge of God the Father and Jesus Christ. Verses 3 through 5. 3. Salvation is readily accessible for those who seek the Lord, verses 6 through 8. 4. True believers will freely confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, verse 9. 5. True faith in Christ is faith in his resurrection. 6. True faith connects with our hearts. True faith connects what our hearts know and believe with what our mouths confess, verse 10. Golden text. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, Romans 10, 9. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is praying for the lost, Romans 10, 1 through 2. The second is pursuing righteousness, Romans 10, 3 through 8. And the third is professing faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9 through 10. Introduction. Sadly, we live in a time when many do not even realize they are lost and in need of salvation. They assume that if there is a heaven, they will certainly be admitted. After all, they are good spouses, good parents, good citizens, good neighbors, and good employees, at least according to their definition of good. Romans declares that we are all sinners, 323, and that the wages of sin is death, 623. Even the most law-abiding citizens fall short of God's divine law. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, 320. If we could be saved by our own efforts or goodness, Christ's coming would have been superfluous. Human pride assumes that we can save ourselves, but salvation is only through faith in Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. Acts 4, 12. Praying for the lost, Romans 10, 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Paul's desire, Romans 10, 1. Romans 9 through 11 focuses on both the present status and the future hope of Israel. 
Paul notes their special privileges, 9, 4 through 5. God's sovereign choice of them as a nation, 11, 5, and their ultimate destiny, verse 25. As Romans 10 opens, Paul's sentiment echo what he had already written. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, 9, 2 through 3. More than anything else, Paul longed for and prayed to God that Israel might be saved. While it is true that Israel was chosen by God for a special role in his plan, each Jewish person also needed faith to be saved. For the most part, they had rejected their own Messiah and needed to repent and believe, Acts 2, 36-39, 3, 12-19. While significant, their heritage was no guarantee of their salvation. As Paul said, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, Romans 9, 6. The forerunner of Christ, John the Baptist, had declared this truth to those who came to listen to him preach at the Jordan, Matthew 3, 7 through 9. Since each individual must exercise personal faith in Christ, how can praying for the unsaved help? First, prayer may soften the hearts of the unsaved and open them to the work of God's Spirit, Acts 16, 14. Second, Prayer may bring about circumstances that cause a person to see his lost condition, verses 23 through 34. Third, prayer will empower believers to speak God's word with boldness, 431, thus enabling a clear and powerful witness to be present to the lost. Paul, of course, realized that prayer was not only the tool to reach lost Israel. Upon entering a city, the very first place he went was the Jewish synagogue, where he preached the gospel, Acts 13, 14, 17, 2, 18, 4. If his fellow Jews rejected the message, he then concentrated on reaching Gentiles. Either way, Paul tried to reach all people so that he might by all means save some, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. He nevertheless had great concern for his own people, realizing that at one time he was just as spiritually blind as them. Israel's zeal, Romans 10, 2. As a nation, Israel not only knew about the one true God, they were also very zealous for him. When Paul was reviewing his, Jew his Jewish pedigree, Philippians 3, 6, he identified his zeal in persecuting Christians as a source of pride prior to his call by Christ on the Damascus Road. Depending on its motives, zeal can be either good or bad. As was true for most Jews, their zeal was not according to knowledge, Romans 10.2. They had rejected their own Savior because they preferred to maintain their man-made traditions such as those promoted by the Pharisees. As Paul himself testified, the, the Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jewish religion, Acts 26.5. They were also among the most zealous opponents of Christ, Mark 3.6, John 5.18. Just because people are sincere and zealous does not mean they are right. Suicide bombers are both sincere and zealous, but their actions are clearly evil. Before his conversion, Paul was sincere and zealous, but he was wrong. Neither his sincerity nor his zeal made his actions right. While having knowledge without faith is insufficient, having correct knowledge is vitally important. As God said to ancient Israel, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Hosanna 4, 6. Pursuing righteousness, verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth, verse 5. 
For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up again from the dead. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Willing ignorance. Romans 10, 3 through 4. As mentioned previously in our study of Romans, righteousness is often used by Paul to to mean a right relationship with God. Since most of Israel had rejected Jesus as their Messiah, they had not submitted themselves to God's way of righteousness through Jesus Christ. Indeed, they had established their own means of attaining righteousness, which was wholly inadequate. In scripture, righteousness is not something we achieve, but something we receive through faith in Christ alone. Under the Mosaic law, such things as Sabbath keeping, offering sacrifices, and various rituals intended in part to point toward the need for a Messiah Savior. To be sure, these were divine commands to be obeyed. The problem is that no one can obey them perfectly. Therefore, no one can be saved by keeping the law. Ultimately, the law points to the one who was the perfect sacrifice for sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.24, Colossians 2.16-17, Hebrews 16-17, Hebrews 10.1-4. Christ is the end of the law, Romans 10.4, meaning he is the fulfillment, aim, and purpose of the law, Matthew 5.17. The law and the prophets all point forward to Christ, Luke 24.27-44, John 1 45. For a Jew to reject Jesus and attempt to keep the law is to miss the very reason the law was given to Israel in the first place. Works of the law. Romans 10 5 through 6. Leviticus 18 5 says, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Paul quotes this verse in Romans 10 5. The statement is also alluded to in Nehemiah 9.29 in a review of Hebrew history when Ezra reminded the people in his prayer that Israel dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. As already mentioned, if a person really could perfectly obey God's law, he could, he could claim righteousness based on that achievement. Only the Son of God can make such a claim, however, which allowed him to be a perfect sacrifice for sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. In contrast to righteousness based on the law is the righteousness that comes by faith. This righteousness takes a completely different approach. Righteousness based on the law emphasized doing works on one's own, whereas righteousness by faith stressing, stresses trusting in another for righteousness. God's way of salvation is not difficult and complicated. We do not have to go to heaven to find Christ or into the world of the dead. He is near to us. In other words, the gospel of Christ, the word of faith, is available and accessible. The sinner need not perform difficult works in order to be saved. All he has to do is trust Christ. Word of Faith, Romans 10, 7-8 The quotation used by Paul in verses 6-8 through 8 comes from Deuteronomy 30, 11-14. Moses knew at this point that his days were numbered. Hence, he delivered a series of sermons to the people of Israel before they entered the Promised Land. The name Deuteronomy literally means second law, and it was to a large degree a repetition of the law given on Sinai. Moses was repeating it to the children of the previous generation. 
the generation's parents had died in the desert as punishment for their lack of faith. Numbers 32, 13. After listing the blessings of obedience, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, and the curses on disobedience, verses 15 through 68, the people were exhorted to keep God's covenant, chapter 29. While the people might have concluded that obedience was hindering, was hidden, 30, 11, from them it was not. They would not have to go to heaven and bring it down, verse 12, nor was it necessary for them to travel beyond the sea, verse 13, to learn God's will. Rather, it was very nigh unto them in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it, verse 14. Interpreting the above text in light of the gospel, Paul declares that it was not necessary for a person to have Christ come down from heaven or to bring him up from the dead in order for them to know him as Lord, especially since Jesus had already risen. This, as Paul says, is the word of faith, which we preach, Romans 10, 8, and is significant to bring the message of redemption to a lost world. The word of faith which Paul preached was the historical event of the death and resurrection of Christ. Professing faith in Christ, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, verse 10. For, when the heart, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. To confess Christ with the mouth might be called the good confession. Paul reminded Timothy that he had professed a good profession or confession before many witnesses, 1 Timothy 6.12. Before Pilate, Jesus himself made the good confession by affirming his identity, verse 13. Unlike other confessions that might admit wrongdoing or even criminal behavior, confessing Christ is wholly positive. For in this way we publicly profess our faith in the risen Son of God. Confessing Christ as Lord and Savior does not have the same connotation as confessing our sins because one is a confession of hope while the other is a confession of conviction. Matthew 6.6 6. 1 John 1, 9. That Paul does not mention repentance here should not be taken to mean that he felt it is unnecessary. As he reminded the Ephesian elders, his preaching included repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 21. Indeed, all those who come to Christ must repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1, 15. Acts 2, 38. 319, 1730. These verses in Romans also remind us of the great confession Peter made when he declared of Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. This truth is the fact, this truth is in fact the rock, verse 18, upon which Christ would build his church. When the Ethiopian eunuch asked, What doth hinder me to be baptized? Acts 8.36, Philip told him that if he believed with all his heart, he was a fit candidate for this Christian ordinance. Consequently, the eunuch declared, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 37, Upon his profession of faith, the new convert was immediately baptized and went on his way rejoicing. Verse 39, not only must we believe in our hearts that Christ died for our sins and arose the third day, we must be willing to acknowledge this openly. That such a confession is vitally important is seen from the words of Christ to his disciples. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 through 33. It should be noted that simply stating that we believe in Jesus is insufficient unless we truly trust him as Lord and Savior. Note also that belief in the bodily resurrection of Christ is not optional. It is essential 
as it is the co the cornerstone of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 57. The heart represents the inner person, while faith exists, Romans 10, 10. The mouth must express what is in the heart. Such faith leads to righteousness, a right relationship with God. Confessing Christ leads to salvation. The Hebrew parallelism makes confession and belief, as well as righteousness and salvation, two sides of the same coin. It is possible to believe much about Jesus and remain unsaved, since we must be willing to actually commit ourselves to Christ and to depend on him and him alone for justification. Even during Christ's ministry, some were unwilling to fully commit to him. John 12, 42-43 says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. After confessing Christ, we must progress in holiness, or else we will remain immature, babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.1 If we remain such, we will likely act as did the carnal, contentious Corinthians. Paul did not doubt their salvation, one, two, but he knew their sanctification was lagging. Grace is free. But it is not cheap. Martyr German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Such grace is really no grace at all. Questions. 1. What did Paul pray for regarding Israel? 2. What was unfortunately true about Israel's zeal for God, according to Romans 10.2? 3. What kind of righteousness did the Jews attempt to establish? 4. How does Paul describe Christ's relationship to the law? Five, what is the contrast between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of faith? Six, what point is Paul making from the quotation in Deuteronomy? Seven, what was the word of faith that Paul preached? Verse eight. Eight, what are we doing when we confess Christ? Nine, what essential Christian doctrine must be believed in the heart? 10. Can a person believe in Christ and still be unwilling to confess him? Explain. This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, May 16, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.